My name is Farhan Ahmad and I'm a lecturer at DHS Sufa University, Karachi. And today we'll be discussing a topic called contemporary issues and business. So we have already had three or four lectures recorded regarding the subject, but today we'll be discussing PR and advertising. So we'll be looking at public relations and we'll be looking at ethics in advertising. So if you remember, in the very last lecture, we did discuss most of the topics related to this particular subject. And those topics, of course, were related to uh, the ethics. So in the last lecture, if you remember, we discussed ethics. And we said that ethics are the set of moral standards. It's a set of moral principles. It's a set of values that a person has. And when we discuss how do we get our ethics, we, we concluded and we agreed upon that ethics are either acquired by nature or nurture. Either you get it from the environment that you have been brought up in or your parents give you the set of ethics. And most of the time we see the roots of the ethics are from the religion or maybe some kind of belief. So yes, we do have iconoclasts out there who are the people who attack the widely established belief or firmly established belief. So if someone is attacking on a strongly established belief, he will be an iconoclast. And based on his morality and values, he sort of discards the other beliefs. So we don't want to get into that detail that why people are against the mainstream beliefs or the religions. That's a separate topic. But when we discuss ethics, so far what we have agreed upon that yes, it is a set of moral standards and values that a person has. And it is acquired by either nature or nurture. And we also discussed the Lawrence Kohlberg mo model in order to define the level of morality. We discussed that how morality can be uh, divided into pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional levels, where we see the moral development of the people. So pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional level. These were the three levels that we discussed in the very last lecture. And we discussed that how a person's morality can be categorized, can be classed into three different segments. So when we were discussing ethics, we had discussed a range of case studies. And off the top of my head, I told you that, yes, we can discuss about the GM motors, uh, how the ignition problem caused so many accidents and people died. And GM Motors was doing the cost and benefit analysis. They were putting the profit before the people. They were not concerned too much about the people's well-being or their lives. They were more concerned about the profit. And similarly, case is, a similar case is the case of Ford Pinto, where the fuel tank was installed at the rear end of the car. And every time there's an accident, this car will catch fire and people will die. Although the company was aware of all these uh, effect, uh, side effects, all the you know uh, problems that uh, were in the in the in the product in the cars, but they did not fix it. Why? Because it was too costly, and they kept paying the damages to the injured people, to the deceased people, and this is where the ethics come into play. So there are a range of cases in in which we can look at ethics, that how companies take a decision when it comes to moral reasoning. So their moral reasoning is mostly driven by the, by the uh, profit. And their uh, sort of like uh, moral sort of like, the, when they get into the moral dilemma, they try to focus more on the profit side than the people side. So as a business, you owe a duty of care to the society, apart from the corporate social responsibility that you have. But yes, in these extreme cases, we see that people forget about their morality and they are more. So always, a person will be sandwiched between two things, uh, morality and obligation towards his family and obligation towards his company. And when we discuss family, it does also discuss the, it is also about the community that he has a moral obligation to. So if I am a business person, I have a moral obligation towards the community, my family, and my business. So if you, I have to pick and choose, most of the time people pick their company over the interest or the well-being of the community. So this is what I've been trying to establish. And I said that there were two major uh, philosophical uh, sort of like uh, uh, philosophical perspectives that drives your uh, decision making under these circumstances when you are 
caught up in a moral dilemma. And those uh, perspectives are utilitarianism and categorical imperative. <clears throat> so when we discuss utilitarianism, that's by Jeremy Bentham. And Jeremy Bentham says, greatest happiness to the greatest number of people. So he was a British philosopher, and he was a student of John Stuart Mill. So John Stuart Mill also has contributed towards utilitarianism, and that's about greatest happiness to the greatest number of people, or greatest utility to the greatest number of people, in which the consequence decides whether the action is right or wrong. So if I'm a Robin Hood, I go rob people, and I distribute that robbed money or plundered money into the poor community, and poor community are able to buy food, and these people are happy. So my consequence, the consequence of my action is a good, act, good consequence. It's, it means that my action is a good action. If the consequence of my action was bad consequence, so my action would have been classed as bad action, as per the consequentialist view, which is the Jeremy Bentham's view. So you, you can very well see here that even if I commit a crime, that might not be classed as a bad action, so long the consequence of this crime is a good, a good result. So this is, uh, is ve this is very tricky, but most of the time, if, when we go through the Heinz dilemma, and for example, we are sailing from, on a boat from one end to another end, and we start sinking, the boat starts sort of like sinking, and we are 10 people in the boat and we realize boat is overloaded. So if we do not chuck two or three people into the water, the boat might capsize and we might all drown. So sacrificing three people at the, you know, for the benefit of the seven people might be a good action because at the end of the day, we are saving seven lives. So there's a great uh, dilemma where uh, people say, okay, okay, there's a bogey coming down on the railway track and this railway track has got two bifurcations. So one hand, one person is tied up, one hand there are five people tied up. So who will you save? Whether it's the five people or one people? And logic says yes, I'll be saving the five persons because why they are more in number. But when we look at uh, the other person, he might be a philanthropist, he might be running uh, you know, th the houses of thousands of people. So this is where it becomes very tricky. In categorical imperative, we discuss that any action uh, will be a good action if it fulfills the duty. This is deontological view, and this is by Immanuel Kant. So if it fulfills a duty, that is a good action, deontological, duty-based, deon. So if uh, we go by Immanuel Kant, we, we say that we do not cheat, we do not lie, we do not uh, kill, because it does not fulfill the duty. But we do help other, we do love each other, and all these things, we are being truthful and honest, and that drives us to PRSA, Public Relations Society of America. This is called Public Relations Society of America, and they've come up with their own codes of ethics. And what they have done, they have come up with some core codes and they have produced, they produce public relation officers mainly. And those officers believe, strongly believe or practice these courts. And those courts, we have got advocacy, we have got honesty, we have got loyalty, independence, expertise, fairness. So these are the six codes that this particular society has come up with, American Society for Public Relations Officers. And as you are aware that most of the time, it is the duty of the public relations officers to defend the company if company has done something wrong or there is a corporate scandal that is brewing up. So public relations officer always, must always ensure advocacy. They should promote activities and they should advocate uh, social activity where this type of issue can be discussed. They should not kill the freedom of expression. They should rather encourage debate over such type of corporate scandals and they should allow space or they should allow all the stakeholders to criticize. 
Honesty, of course, it goes without saying that the public relations officer should not conceal any details. They should be honest and they should not twist or alter the facts. They should not misrepresent or misquote anyone. So that's, that's very important that you have to be honest. And there are so many manipulative ways to twist the reality, to distort the reality, to sort of like half represent the reality. So this is where uh, all the public relations officers, if you guys become one. And this is a very important contemporary issue right now. Yes, like in order to save the company, as I've already discussed here, people generally put the people, uh, the, the public at, uh, at, uh, at the, at, uh, they sacrifice the interests of the public. Then comes loyalty. You have to be loyal to all the stakeholders. It's not only the company. So you have a responsibility towards shareholders, towards the government, towards the public, towards the suppliers, customers, everyone. So that's where your loyalty will come into play. Independent, you should not be influenced by any, any, any sort of like factor, be it any personal factor, personal biases. You should not be influenced by any high up. You should not be po have any political influence over you. And you should function and perform your duties without any sort of like influence. Then comes expertise. You must be an expert, a media expert, a communication expert to defend the company that you're working for, okay? And comes fairness, you should be fair. You should not mistreat one party and mistreating one party, obviously it signals to us uh, withholding of information or maybe just, you know, showing one side of the story and not showing the whole story. So that's, that's the second thing. So when we discuss ethics in public relations, and there are some guidelines. So you should always promote the free flow of information. You should also ensure that there is no conflict of interest. Apart from conflict of interest, you should promote uh, sort of like professional uh, ethics. You should promote competition. So all these things are the examples of what we call it guidelines of PRSA. So advertising ethics, if you remember in the last class I had discussed some of the major advertising ethics and there was some called deception. So first thing, deceptive advertisement, you have to be doing away from that. Uh, deceptive means what? Showing something and selling something else. So your advertisement should not have deception in it, okay? So deceptive. And then comes exaggeration, you should not exaggerate. So we see Sometimes adverts are exaggerated and they show the results of the product, a very, uh, I mean, some extraordinary results, but when you c bring that product to your home and you try and uh, use that product, it's not the same. So in deception, if you see the burger, they're having a massive buy of the burger, but when you go, go and buy that burger, the burger is so small. In exaggeration, when they show the washing powder, it is washing something, and the results are so dazzling, but when you try the same washing powder at home, it's not the same thing. Then comes sexual appeal. So in every ad you will see there is a component of nudity and the question is whether sex can sell. So we understand sexual appeal of women have been utilized as an object and this is called women objectification. So women objectification is very common nowadays in the ads and that should not take place because it impacts the overall uh, uh, sort of like uh, image of the woman in the society, it promotes the stereotyping and it is very misogynistic. So we want to do away from all these things. We want to beat misogyny, we should not promote it. So as a, a responsible, uh, you know, advertiser, you should do away. Then come puffery. Puffery is about using credible people to enhance the a credibility of a product, like maybe TV actors or something, their testimonials will show that this product is really good. So that's puffery. And then concealment of facts. Concealment of facts about the side effects. Side effects of a product, you might not be showing all the side effects. So there's a range of uh, issues related to ethics in advertising that we can discuss. Some of the issues I have just highlighted here, and uh, these are the very important issues, the nudity, and the question is whether sex can sell. That's a big question. So all these things have been done in uh, 
uh, have been uh, taking place right now and we see there's so much uh, going on in the advertising world and given the fact that AI is coming up, so we don't know what will happen in the future, but so far, uh, as far as the ethics in advertising and public relations is concerned, so this is the topic that I wanted to cover. So thank you so much. I'll cover the next topic regarding contemporary issues in business, which will be about creativity and innovation. And meanwhile, you look after yourself, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.